Welcome to the Mission Driven Leader, presented by TaleoConnects.com, where we explore the new, unknown, and innovative themes for work and give people the ability to show up resilient every day. Here are your hosts, former Chief Knowledge Officer of NASA, Ed Hoffman, and partner and Vice President of Portfolio Management at Taleo, Laurel Sim. Well, welcome back to the Mission Driven Leader podcast, Ed. I'm so excited to have you, as I always am. Um, And I'm really looking forward to our guest, Larry, because I know you guys have a long history and he can tell me some dirt on you. Yeah, I don't know if there's that much dirt, uh, but but perhaps so. But uh, no, you know, I'm very excited uh, whenever I get to be with Larry, because as I've said before to, to both of you, Larry is the person I wanted to grow up to be. And I'm on the way to to getting there. And uh, no, you have certain people that you look up to when you've worked with them, certain heroes, I guess. I think that's appropriate. And Larry is uh, really at the top of the list for that. So to me, it's exciting, you know, for me. Right? Like you probably have here. I mean, who do you I, have heroes, Laura? I um, I the- wow, talk about putting a girl on a spot. <laughs> I have so many All heroes. Right. Um, but uh, I look forward to maybe have adding Larry at okay. the end of this podcast to to that kind of stature because uh, I think heroes are what make us better and strive harder and give us a, a reason to poke holes in who we are in our current place. So that's kind of it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Look at the map behind Laurel's head. Look what she did in our honor. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I want to make Larry. And Ed feels yeah. as comfortable as possible today. So yeah. I'm giving you the map of That's... New York. Are you guys feeling a little bit more cozy? Right behind yes. your head, Laurel. Right yeah. behind your head is where Ed and I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> That's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Oh, if we put a if we put a line straight through your nose to the other end, that's where we grew up. Pretty Did much. I? Well, behind but... it. If it went through it. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, there you are. Yeah. Well, aren't yeah. you two pretty cool? Like, I didn't know that my map was going to be so rewarding today. Yeah, it is. It's a uh, makes very us feel warm. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Ed, before we get too far down our path, do you want to introduce Larry? Because I think I think all of his accolades and efforts over the year deserve a yeah. little uh, acknowledgement before we start harassing him. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I would start off by. Uh, uh, he, he's very well known, uh, Larry Prezak. He's really been working uh, and studying about knowledge and learning in organizations for the better part of 30 years. Uh, he was a founder of the Ernst & Young Center for Business Innovation, uh, founder and director of the IBM Institute for Knowledge Management. Uh, he was essential uh, at NASA. Um, for several years before I was asked to be the chief of knowledge officer and to formalize uh, a knowledge program at NASA, Larry, Don Cohn, Nancy Dixon, and others were working together. Uh, Larry was the, uh, the pivot, uh, the center, uh, if you will, of, of a lot of the activities and a lot of the wisdom. He's worked at McKinsey at the World Bank, and he's authored some of the best-selling books over the last 30 years. Uh, he's co-authored and uh, edited a dozen books, uh, 17 of which have been translated into different languages. And uh, he's just a source. He really is. uh, He's a renaissance man of knowledge in terms of work, organizations, people, how things work. And what I related to at the very beginning is that when I think what, what I like about organizations and projects is I find them funny. Laurel, we laugh a lot about the crazy things in organizations. When I first started reading Larry and uh, his books, and when he started presenting, I started laughing at the reality of organizations, and uh, and so I think that's that that's how I introduce him. They're really, really a thorough Renaissance man about work, organizations, and and Brooklyn and Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> wow, that is um, quite the accolades, Larry. He should become your spokesman. Um, the fortunate part really is, is it's all true. I am. I am. Yeah. I am. Very true. Yeah. 
So where should we begin, Ed? There's so many places, so many paths that we can go. Do you want to kind of um, start well, us off? Let me be let me be selfish here because one of the things I'm excited about is next week. We're we're recording this in in the summer. Uh, next week, uh, a book that I've been working with uh, Larry and our colleague Matt Kohut is coming out. It's called The Smart Mission, and it is NASA's lessons for managing knowledge, uh, people, and projects. And uh, I knew why I did did the book, but um, again, Larry, as I said, had a, a dozen books, uh, uh, probably the best book on knowledge, uh, working knowledge he did with uh, his colleague, uh, partner, Tom Davenport. So I'll start with the question of uh, why did you do uh, another book on knowledge and organizations, The Smart Mission? That's a good question. Uh, I really enjoyed working with Ed very much, and I enjoyed working at NASA. And I realized they were doing quite a few innovative things. I played a role in some, Ed played a role in more than that. They're really innovative. I don't mean just going to the moon. That's innovative. Sure. But they were managing innovatively, putting in place innovative practices. And it occurred to me, someone should really write more about this. Everyone who writes about NASA writes about Apollo, writes about the great triumph of going to the moon and NASA. And it's wonderful. I mean, they deserve all that. But no one wrote about NASA as an organization and especially how they manage projects. But it occurred to me, well, he, Ed can't write that while he's in NASA because they look at every comma and every word, you know, the government. So I said, well, maybe one day he'll leave there. Well, he did leave. And they said, Ed, and he told me he really liked to become a prominent consultant and spread what he knows. I said, Ed, you're really on the way. You have a platinum resume, chief knowledge officer of NASA. I mean, believe me, people will want you. Trust me, you're a very good speaker, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing you really need is a good book behind you. This happened to me too, the same thing. And I talked him into, uh, didn't take a lot, but I somewhat talked him into, let's write a book about what we did at NASA and other companies. We don't just talk about NASA. I had a lot of experience in other firms and so did the other fellow we're writing with. So I went to MIT and I said, I have a really good book for you. They know who I am. So they let me in the door and uh, we sold them on the book. <laughs> that was it. So it was, a, it was an exciting experience. I really enjoyed writing it. It was a lot of fun. We really, we laugh a lot. Three of us have a very similar sense of yeah. humor. We have a good time. We had a good time doing it. And basically, I guess I'm sort of an evangelical, but using knowledge effectively. And so is Ed. We really, we believe in this. We believe in this. And uh, we wrote the book. For, one of the reasons is to spread the word that use knowledge well. I'd also, um, you know, one of the things that, um, I guess I latched onto you early. You said something, and I can always hear you saying it and see you doing it. Uh, but when you said that knowledge is profoundly social, it was something that I saw over and over again at NASA and at other organizations is that it comes down to the people. Do we trust each other? Do we respect each other? You know, the, the notions of inclusion and uh, and really just supporting the people so that the, the, the words and the ideas get out there. Uh, and you put it out there, uh, very front and center. And uh, it's still a concept that I think is, it's talked about, but I don't think it's really bought into uh, in, in a lot of organizations, the profound importance of the social relationships to open up knowledge, expertise, and innovation. I got, I learned a lot of that. I studied the history of ideas as an undergraduate and a graduate student. And there's quite a few well-known philosophers. Nobody reads that stuff except people like me, academics. But they all uh, they all say Thank it. God, because I was feeling alone in this conversation. No, 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 no. It's only, <laughs> only people like me read that stuff, and then I gave it up. Uh, but it did say, you know, you can't know anything alone. You just can't. I mean, I can remember my grandmother uh, kissing me goodbye when I went off to the subway. I'm the only one on earth who remembers that. But that's memory. But in terms of what a grandmother is, what grandmothers are like, knowledge of grandmothers, things like that, that's social. We have we share the same ones. We all know what grandmothers are like. I mean, there may be difference of opinions. You can't know something alone. You can remember all sorts of things, but you really, unless you're completely nuts, you can't know something alone. So, so, so can I can I pause this for a quick question? 
Um, with that in mind, what do I do with those people that are in the room that need to be the smartest person in the room every single time? How do I explain to them, you can't do this alone? That's right. I would, well, you're absolutely right, Laurel. And I know just what you mean. I've been in those situations too. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I've sometimes just put my head down. Sometimes I've gotten angry and if I didn't need the job, I must just quote to them. You know, I said, <laughs> You know, Kant out. and David Hume on forward, all the great thinkers of the world knew that that's crap. You can't know things alone. There's nothing you know that other people don't know and you didn't learn from other people. There's very, very little. There's originality in science. You know, you can discuss, find a new mathematical theorem. You could find a new chemical compound. You could find a new element in the atom. They're working on that now. That's a discovery, but it's based on an enormous amount of knowledge that came before that. You couldn't do that if there weren't thousands of physicists working on that sort of issues. And no one knows any, I mean, this, it's a trouble, Laurel. One of the problems, uh, I don't want to get into politics, is that the US and Canada, and a lot of the Anglo country, the Anglo, sort of Anglophone country, uh, have a tremendous belief in individualism. Now, I'm not, I'm not against individualism in many ways, I like it, but it doesn't work for trying to work collectively. It just, it's not the right idea. It isn't. Now, some countries don't have any of that. Some of the Asian countries have that Confucian ideas, and I'm not holding that up as better or worse, but they have it. It's sure better in running a company <laughs> to have those ideas that are Confucian. We work together. Everything's done as a group. Uh, it just works better in running a company. Sorry, but that's the way things are. I'm not, again, I like being individualistic and things like that, but you're trying to go to the moon, you sure better work together. I just read today's newspaper Ed, that the Koreans are, are want to go to the moon. Yeah. A country that when I was a boy was just wiped out. That no GNP was just Japan owned it for a hundred years, treated them like dogs. Then they had the Korean War. They were nowhere. And there's no natural resources in Korea. There's nothing there. I've been there a few times. All they have is themselves and what they know. And then now they've now have their number seven, I think, GDP per capita, and they're going to go to the moon. Think about that. What? How did they do that? You think they all were individual, Mr. Sue, Mr. Kim, Mr. This? No. They have that Confucian ethos, which works very well for certain things in life. Well, one of the answers, I think, to the question is we address that um, issue of uh, how do you get uh, people to be comfortable sharing with the notion of culture. And uh, knowledge does, doesn't happen by itself. Learning just right doesn't happen. It's organizations, teams, families create cultures. You know, these are the unwritten rules for what's right, what's what's not wrong. And one of the things I would I would get asked the question at NASA exactly what you said is how could that person have made that decision? Often a decision that didn't include other people, that didn't engage, that was wrong. And I'd say, let's think about, you know, what we do. We always tell our people, don't bring me a problem. Bring me a solution. We hire people who are smart, who are probably told from the time that they're growing up by their grandmothers, their grandfathers, their, how brilliant they were, how wonderful they were. We teach them to compete, right, to get the you know, best grade. So we really spend a lot of years uh, raising people that being smart means that you have your own answers and solutions and don't raise a problem only bring us the solution. And that's led to, that's led to failure, that, that sense of it. So we have to create a culture, I think, that says it's okay not to know, that it's valuable to get help from others that you're working with, uh, that it's important to hear the voice of, of different folks, so. And then, but then how do we create the balance? Because the, my other greatest pet peeve, I know I've got a million of them, I know, gentlemen, that's, that's part of me, um, is, over consensus. Oh, no, we all have to have yeah. a consensus on this. We all have to come to agreement on this. Well, that doesn't work either. And, and, no. and in fact, it's actually more difficult to move anything forward than the person that made a bad decision. And then we figure it out and we move on. Yeah. Well, I don't know how, you know, it depends. Generally, if you have a culture of respect, uh, I used to ask firms when I was consulting, can you make a mistake around here? And they said, yeah, you can, you know, if you people... So I think if you have a culture of respect and if there's over, you have too much over compliance. I know what you mean. That's, that's very possible. 
you just people will respect that if you say, look, we're all agreeing on this. Let's let's pick someone to be the devil's advocate and try to punch holes in their argument. Things along that line. I think if the culture works, everything follows. Ed and I really agree on this, that the uh, the culture is really the dominant factor. When it works, it smooths out a lot of other things. When it doesn't, nothing, everything gets dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah. and that culture, it works in business. It works on sporting teams. It works in families, right? Like, yeah, um, so. and making yeah. And making the adjustments appropriate to realign the culture is just as difficult in a family setting as it is a ten thousand dollar or ten thousand employee setting right like but You're it has to right. more so yeah 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 more yeah. so yeah. you know one of the um i shouldn't say what it was one of the biggest and greatest american firms uh, a good friend of ours bob sutton he teaches at stanford he's from michigan and he was a consultant for this firm <laughs> and he said whenever a decision was made everyone looked at the senior person in the room. If you went this way, they go this way. If you went this way, they go that. And that firm is uh, not doing so well lately. And they're over compliance, over respect. You know, oh yeah, he said this. They all follow that. When I was at IBM, I don't mind saying this, the same sort of thing occurred. You'd have to have a very good argument. You could just say, well, maybe we should think about that some more, or maybe we should look into that. People would look at you like, you're not going to get anywhere here. I didn't want to get anywhere, so it didn't matter. But generally, it's true. Yeah, but that's a real fault in firms. Yeah. If you have a culture that's a, oh, maybe he's right, or let's take a look further at that, or let's, I think the best, appoint someone to argue against it, to appoint the devil's advocate. Yeah, Bob, have you seen his new book? It's uh, that he, uh, he has the, the Asshole Survival Guide. Is, uh, Bob, <laughs> so this is a person who has spent a lot of time with organization. <laughs> yeah, you want a copy. No. <laughs> I don't want to take the course. I don't want just yeah. a copy of the book. I want to take the course. Yeah. Um, I was literally just going to say, Larry's my kind of guy. Like I fire myself from clients now because like, yeah. A, I can. And B, like we have to, we have to enjoy our days. We have to feel like we're adding value. And it just, like, I know I bring it up a lot that I fire myself, but I take pride in it because like you, Larry, like sometimes I'm the asshole because I'm leaving, but most of the time it's because of the asshole in the room. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I, you know, it's, I've it's never hard. seen you as an asshole. I would say that right now, no, but no. you know, you know, who knows? Maybe somebody else has seen a different side. So, but, <laughs> I was uh, once speaking to a dean at Harvard, a senior dean there, and I, we had a very good executive ed program in knowledge. Now, the 21st century organization it was called really excellent. Some very well known professors and practitioners like myself and those professors left they retired and i went to the dean so let's continue this program get some other professor and he said knowledge there's no such thing as not not a real subject i looked and i said this is harvard isn't it he goes, yeah yeah i said wow. you're telling me at harvard knowledge isn't a real subject why the hell are you tax exempt <laughs> i really he was furious no one ever spoke to this guy that way yeah but i mean i was on the faculty i didn't care i just couldn't believe that to this day i still he said it wasn't a real subject. I just walked past maybe the Monty Python show that, or Candy kind of fooling around with me. But that's a true story. That's why. Do you think it's because they, they don't actually understand the term knowledge? Yes. Like, what does that really mean? Yes. They can't measure it. They can't touch it. They want to deal with it. That's the philosophy department's venue. They didn't want to deal with it because they couldn't, they couldn't genuinely have a consensus of what it is. And that's the fault of many economists who conflated information and knowledge. One of the things that uh, really I learned from you and that you've written extensively about is that there's a, there's a belief that knowledge is in an organization when really knowledge is with the people in an organization. And maybe you can talk to that and uh, some of your thoughts of what is the nature of knowledge uh, at work, which is why it's so unique. It's such a, a different kind of a uh, uh, thing. Well, if you think about it, <laughs> if knowledge wasn't unique to an organization and to the people in it, every company could do the same thing. We'd have what's one big company. The, uh, there was once a book written called Techno-Utopianism in American Life. People really believe, at least in the U.S., I think in the Anglophone countries that 
Everything can be solved with technology. Everything can be done with technology. They do not believe this in Asia and in most of Europe. Technology is fine. We like it. We live by it. We're doing it here. But it's not knowledge. Knowledge is what people know. <laughs> and you can't. I've gotten to some terrific arguments lately, which I've now given up doing uh, with AI people who think that AI can replicate knowledge. AI can do remarkable things, but it can't do judgment. It can be programmed to do judgment, but it's just the judgment of the programmer. It can do reckoning beyond our imagination, but that's reckoning. Knowledge is a human attribute. You could have to find a different word for what AI does, but it ain't knowledge. Knowledge is what humans do. I love you have a, uh, I was going to ask for your, you define it uniquely. You were asked by a reporter once, what is knowledge? And this was the, the cooking kind of a thing. I, you know, I, I got to set right. you up for sharing that definition. So uh, years ago, I was working for a firm that loved getting the names in the newspaper. I won't say what it was. And I got called by a reporter one time to say, gee, he's hearing a lot about knowledge and your name came up. Can you define it in a way that's easy to understand for our readers, even though it was the Wall Street Journal, you would think the readers could understand things. So I said, and it just came to me in a, out of the blue, a very good answer to this. I said, let's say you've invited someone you really like, your mother, girlfriend, boyfriend, for a dinner. You want to make a really nice dinner. If you get the cookbook, the letters in the recipe are data, A, B, C, D. That's what data is. Information is the recipe. You take two eggs and scramble them. You do this and that. It's information. Knowledge is knowing how to cook. And you get that by cooking. One year, two year, five. Some people never get it. <laughs> and others pick it up quickly. They have a touch for it. But it's knowing how to cook. Wisdom is marrying a good cook. Yes, that's what I did. I was smart. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And Ed too. Me too. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know, but knowledge, you can't just learn knowledge from, you don't know how to cook by reading a recipe. You have to do it. Knowledge is experiential. Mm -hmm. It's experiential. You, you get it by doing things. So then what's your take? Because I'm pretty jacked about what, I, what I'm going to hear. Is What is your take on this? data transformation that's going going up across across the globe and yes. you're not a real company until you've done your data transformation and blah 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 no it's a real thing i mean you can be more efficient using computers better using data better i mean it's true you can it has some tremendous advantages you know if you're a shipping firm i was just talking to some guy shipping firm they can do much more now with data than they ever could and big firms, they could see their sales in New York versus their sales in Boston. It, it's a very useful tool. Well, so is the abacus in China at one point. Uh, it's a very useful tool. Make no mistake about it. And we all use things like that. But it's not knowledge. If you can't interpret the data, if you have your own cognitive biases, if you don't talk to other people, look what they're doing, see what else is being done with it, it's just data. It's good stuff if you know how to use it, but knowing how to use it is like knowing how to cook. 100%. It takes a while to figure that out. And I think a lot of people believe that the second they put the, the tools in front of somebody, that it it now it's like, ah, you guys are going to be brilliant. But it's it's the it's teaching and it's exploring and it's understanding what is it that we're looking at and how can we splice it different right. to be more thoughtful in what we do? Absolutely. There's a guy at the church I go to who's recently died. He was a prominent mathematician. And at his funeral, they handed out a formula he, he did in math. What of an honor to him. Well, I could look at this. I could hold the paper this way or this way. It made no sense to me because I don't know anything about mathematics beyond what was taught in college. And that wasn't much. And I realized, well, you know, I don't have the knowledge. I can't make sense. I'm sure it's a brilliant piece. He was a professor at MIT, but I don't have it. You know, knowledge is doing to to understand that you had to do quite a bit of math to get to the point where you understand that and the same thing with you know it's experiential when toyota i'll tell you a quick easy story when toyota decided to build a luxury car they wanted to get into that market to compete with mercedes some of the german firms and american lincoln and so forth they gave two men gold platinum 
credit cards is. Go to the U.S. for six months and see what the word luxury means across the United States. The smell of it, the feel of it, the color of it, everything about what luxury, is it hard leather, soft leather? Is it bright green or subdued brown? What are the colors that connote luxury? And these guys did it. They spent that money like wild, you know, the food, the colors, clothing, not the other cars, the Toyota knew that, but everything else. And they built a Lexus based on that. So the data they brought back, but people had to explain, this is a luxury color. This is a luxury, this and that. How the, how the wheel felt. They built the Lexus, did pretty well. That's, uh, that's what I drive. So clearly they did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I drove one once. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, clearly and it's a smart firm. It's a smart yeah, firm. Absolutely. They, American would never do that. They said these guys are going to go up drinking all day or go to the track or something. Um, Larry, we're going to just take a brief break. Um, when we come back, I have a burning question to ask you about what your favorite dog is because Ed is, Ed is all about the golden retriever because he feels they're very loyal yet playful. French bulldog. Yeah. Oh, French bulldog. Oh, is, oh, is that what it was? Oh, a French bulldog. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back. We'll get back to the rest of the episode in just a moment. But first, a word from our presenting sponsor, TaleoConnects.com. As a manager, you know how important it is to solve issues right the first time. If you don't, you risk wasting precious time, money, and resources on things that could make the problem even worse. That is why at Taleo, we start by getting to the root cause of your specific problem so that together, we can implement the solution that gets you the results you are looking for the first time. Taleo's unique approach to management consulting and resourcing is focused on building a community of experts that work together to help clients solve complex problems and find success in their businesses. We work collaboratively with you to implement the solution that will solve the root cause of your problem, not just the symptoms of that problem. From management consulting and project management to staff augmentation and resource recruitment, Taleo's trusted team can help you take your organization to the next level. If you're interested in learning more about how Taleo can help you overcome your organization's obstacles and take your business to the next level, visit TaleoConnects.com today. Well, welcome back to the Mission Driven Leader. Um, we're here with Larry and we're, we're talking about knowledge and the passion and experience that this guy has is through the roof. But before we get back to what, what we're really here about, I really need to know what your favorite dog is, Larry. You gotta, you gotta give me some insight. A poodle. A poodle. We, we got a poodle. You like it with pepper and salt or? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we, when our kids were much younger, uh, was, oh, we gotta get them a dog. Brenda grew up with dogs and they were dogs in my neighborhood. My parents wouldn't have one, but there were plenty of dogs on my block, you know. So. And we got a beautiful, uh, German Shepherd, which we all loved, but the allergy, she, she had to get rid of it. So we had, and it broke our heart. Those are was, was wonderful dogs too. So we got a poodle. And the poodle, you know, people think, oh, they're too delicate and this and that. It was a French poodle and all. One thing, the dog was smarter than my son. He's a very smart dog. <laughs> <laughs> really, I was amazed. <laughs> I'm barely exaggerating here. Uh, it, it was a lovely dog. Loyal, smart, fun. And, you know, it lived to be 17, which is great. And wow. it was a little at the end. Wow. But at the end, we just couldn't bear to put it down. That's a, a truth statement. I just couldn't, we couldn't do it. We should have maybe. But it was a wonderful part of the family. You know, it just, I really miss having a dog now. I must say, I'm alone in the house a lot. I'm in my work room here. I would love to have a dog around, but uh, it's sometimes, you know, the dog, every morning, the do, I would walk it. It would put its paw on my face at 6 a.m. Say, come on, time to walk me. Be like, Larry, come on, let's do this. That's right. And it's, you know, 10 degrees below zero. And I'm happy in the bed. I have to throw on something. After a while, I taught the dog. I'd open the dog. It did its business and it came back. I didn't have to go outside. So I got a good payback for its smartness. So, and you don't, you don't chase the ball like Ed does with, with no. his, uh, the dog wouldn't do it. The oh. dog would sort of look, are you kidding? I don't want to do that. 
<laughs> All right. So let's get uh, back to knowledge. Um, and I know I was kind of getting ready to cut you off when we were going to commercial. So do you have a, a question you want to share with us? I guess one of the questions is how does an organization start? You set up the IBM program. You set up uh, the Ernst & Young program. You did the work with, uh, with Tom at Babson. What's the starting point? I think a lot of people are confused about how do you start yeah, it's a good effectiveness point. around this topic of knowledge in an organization? That's or a very a good question. Ed. You know, actually, that would, if we ever wrote another book, which I don't think I have the energy to do, a good title. Yeah, book. we're going to do another Get it, one. Getting started. That's After really this one gets out there, we're going to do the next one. Uh, I would say there's sort of two directions, and that this is something just off the top of my head. Ed. One would be, you have to get people, the senior people, to understand what knowledge is. Grab them, bring them into a room. We said, you're not leaving here till we know the difference between knowledge and information. If you think they're the same thing, why do you go get a second mortgage to send your kid to Harvard? Send them to some state school. They'll read the same books. Come on, there's a big difference. You know, get them to really understand this. If that doesn't work, which is possible, believe me, I would... And Ed heard me say this as a Protestant hymn, right in the corner where you are, start doing knowledge activities in an area you can control, be it five people, 10 people, a division, a unit, start speaking it up. We're going to have knowledge programs. We're going to have knowledge speakers. We're going to do things differently. Ed did this at NASA, by the way. Really, We have an academy. We bring in speakers, people talking about what they know, how they learn, how to build the rover. I was in the room. When some of these great NASA speakers spoke on uh, what they did. And they did man, they didn't always use the word uh, knowledge, but they sure told great stories. And at the end, we say they knew what they were doing because they had been doing this for years. And they spoke to every other engineer, the constant discussion, so they could build the rover. And I was in the room, and everyone was listening carefully, taking notes. It was a marvelous experience. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. It should. Our book talks about it. But that's the only way I could see starting. Start small, success is like a viral meme if you do expand, or get the approval of, you know, the World Bank hired a guy, a direct chairman, which I named Jim Wolfenson, who said, we're going to make this the knowledge bank. And he did understand what knowledge was. And they, they took the bank and moved it quite a bit further towards that goal. Uh, World Bank directors can only last as long as U.S. presidents do. They're gone at that point. <laughs> True. They were appointed by a U.S. president. So uh, it didn't stick as well as it could, but it stuck well enough that people would talk about it. you got to get the word out there. you got to have people talking about knowledge. It's as simple as that. If they what about don't... stories? You know, stories we're both believers in stories. And I think you're yes. a storyteller. Yeah. Well, yeah, so are you. <laughs> yeah. We all are. Everyone tells. So we're awash in stories. We live by stories. You really, uh... Stories are the conduit of knowledge. Not all knowledge. There's a very great psychologist, James Bruner, who, who wrote some very good articles that there are really two ways to, as conduits of knowledge. One is formulas, algorithms, things you can put in a formula, a blueprint. The other is narratives, two ways. Narratives convey context. Narratives convey, you don't have to be exact. There's an English word people don't use too much, but verisimilitude. It's a hard word to even say, but it means truthiness. Stories can get at the truth of stuff. It doesn't have to be exact, but when you hear it, you know it's true. Well, the other things, and God love them, you don't want to build a plane without them. Again, algorithms, formulas, blueprints, things that can, are exact. Those are the two conduits of knowledge transfer. And they both work. They're both vital for an organization. I said those people hearing NASA, how they built the rover was wonderful. But NASA also has tons of blueprints and tons of studies. So they, they use both effectively and it works. So if I was to build, if I was to go into an organization and say, hey, let's start somewhere and just build a knowledge center of excellence. Yeah. How would I describe a day in the life of the knowledge center of excellence? Well, actually, we have a client, I think, uh, I won't say who it is, who we're going to start doing that, Ed and I, for a, a very major client. Well, I'd first of all talk to people. I would, I'm a great believer in sort of talking and saying, what do you think knowledge is? Do you have enough knowledge to do your work effectively? Are there ways you could use knowledge better? What are you missing? What do you have? Talk to people from top to bottom. 
You could also do, you could watch, you could do ethnography. You can watch how they work. Spend the day watching someone, an analyst, let's say, or someone who mid-level. What did they do? Do they get on the phone and talk to other people? Do they use the internet all the time to find out things? And see how they work. And then you could do a model of how knowledge is used in this unit, in this division. This company we're talking about is too big to do that to the whole company, but for enough, you could build little models. Here's how knowledge works. I did a study once. Um, it was cut short, although it was published in the Harvard Business Review. It was cut short because my co-author died, unfortunately. And we wanted to see, we followed people at Novartis, the oncology unit. Novartis is, I think, the second biggest drug company in the world. And we watched them, how they use knowledge and what stopped them from using knowledge effectively. What they didn't get, what they meant. They all said, we don't know what people know in this firm. It's so bloody big. And it would help us enormously if I could find out who's working on this molecule. And of course it would, but they didn't have any mechanism. They had to call and call and call. Hey, who's doing it? Oh, I think there's a guy in Zurich doing that. And the costs of knowledge. Knowledge yeah. is expensive. It's expensive to get. We all have to learn, go to schools. And it's expensive to transfer. It's not free. If it was, the world would look different. If everyone knew it could get everything, real knowledge, not information. Man, yes. It'd be a different world. You know, um, sorry, I'm going to steal this for another second here, Ed. Um, I, I, I love the concept of creating a model because that actually is a great visual kind of conduit to being yes. able to tell the story, yeah. explain things out. I've been in a couple organizations that the model would look like a cartoon strip, not going to lie to you, because uh, of the way they don't function, the way they don't collaborate with, the way they don't collect information and data in a thoughtful manner where, where you're going to be able to use something, uh, which, which reinforces the need for, for um, doing kind of center of excellences for, for knowledge and that sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah. It, uh, the first model might be a cartoon strip. Might be. That's not bad. You could use Dilbert if you get that. <laughs> <laughs> Led to more conversations than anything else. I think Dilbert, right? Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Whatever works, do whatever works. I'm a great believer in pragmatism. If it works, it's true. I was going to follow I, uh, up with this. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, no, please follow up. I was going to follow up is saying, what have you learned uh, that's different uh, as to who Larry Prusak is in terms of thinking about knowledge and organizations today than 20 years ago? To leave it or not, not as much as you may think. I sort of got a big immersion in this. When I first got interested in this, I was with Tom Davenport and Ernst & Young Center for Business, uh, something or other. And I tried to dive into a subject. You know, I got interested and I just, I bought hundreds of books on this, read everything I could, sort of like starting a dissertation. And began to, we got 30 or 40 organizations who were interested in this subject. And we began to visit them. And some really were doing things, others didn't know what the hell knowledge was, but I would visit them and talk to them. And I got a huge dose, both practical and theoretical knowledge about knowledge in organizations. And I found a few professors who were studying this and I would visit them and talk to them. And I found Professor Nonaka in Japan, who really is the guru's guru on this subject. I went and talked to him. And uh, so I really feel I got learned enough in those five or six years yeah, sure, it had some additional things, but the technology changed, but that didn't sort of change my ideas of what knowledge is. The world got much more globalized, which shows to me greater need for knowledge. The only thing, like I said, the thing I've learned more about, got more, is culture itself, how the various cultures of learning in countries and regions. I didn't really know that much about that, and I've been reading, and I found that a very interesting subject. I just finished reading a book called The First Knowledge Economy. And uh, it was Holland in the 16th century. Very interesting. They took in, you know, this is 16th century. Europe was full of tremendous religious hatred and wars. 30 years war, you know, people, Protestants, Catholics, everyone, Muslims, Jews, they were all fighting. Holland decided not to do that. <laughs> and they invited Jews and Muslims into the country. And these people knew things. Some of them were quite, you know, really. One was Spinoza, a famous philosopher. And uh, they built universities and they kept the ink 
spending on warfare way down and they put it into commerce and they realized they could make money if they knew things. And it was the first real knowledge economy. England was soon after. Those two countries are still two of the richest countries in the world. Interesting, it, isn't it? Uh, it, does, it, it does beg to, to question how, how uh, countries evolve or don't evolve, right? Um, without, very, yeah. Very, very interesting. I, when I, when I was I when I was listening to that and Ed, yes, I have to do my one farm, you know, qualification. Farmers are great, but in fact, I do. I do. No, we we grew up with animals in in Brooklyn too. So you guys, we all farms. Sure did. you guys, they yeah. bite us. You guys actually did a lot of, of knowledge management um, because you had to figure out how, how you guys could get to the bathroom without getting beat up. <laughs> That's true. Very that's, true. That's very that. true. Yeah, that's right. I have to say, yeah. I don't take a subway yeah. ride so without you guys getting had, You had to like, you know, <laughs> have those conversations, figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. It was the big topic of, of, among the boys I knew. That was a big topic. Yeah, you can't go in right now, dude. You gotta, you gotta wait. Pee in an hour. hour. Yeah, you're, yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, right. yeah. Is is about the farmer because they're, they're typically it's a farm family individual in Canada. They're moving to more corporate farming um, as well, but yes. that's another topic for another day. Um, but so you've got this individual farmer that's learning and growing and evolving, and they never have the perfect answer. So they're always on the phone to their neighbor saying, "Hey, this is going on. Have you seen it before? Yeah. You know, like this is what I know. This is what I don't know." And then you get this like little collaboration. Bob calls John, John calls Jeff, Derek calls Harry, and they all have these conversations. And then they get back to Bob in the beginning and they're like, dude, this is what you need to do. And that's yeah. and and that's because it's always worked for them, not because that, you know, they it just it's just how the culture of the farmer exists. Um, like the culture of protecting your buddies in uh, Brooklyn? No. Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yes. Brooklyn. Yeah, yes, Brooklyn. Most you know, the network, right, Larry? It's about the network. Yeah. Maybe the most important. There's a thing. whole it's... subject called knowledge geography. I have a, two books on it. Where, like the farmers, you know, in in large cities, generally now it's changed somewhat because of technology. But there were neighborhoods, areas with all people, like the Diamond District in Manhattan. There's two streets in Manhattan which only only sell diamonds. Diamonds traded. Because they trade knowledge with each other, you know, where the diamonds yeah. are coming from. And they're all prosperous. They realize if they all trade information and trade knowledge, Absolutely. they all prosper. In Holland, the same thing happened. And in London, there were neighborhoods where people developed. It's a very interesting subject, yeah. knowledge geography. It really is. And you think about it. And, uh, and also, Holland was open. They, they weren't religious. They went to Japan and... Uh, the Japanese originally, the Portuguese were the first to go there. And the Portuguese did not, didn't want to trade with them. They wanted to convert them to Christianity. This was not a success. Then the English came, and the English were half and half. They didn't want to trade. They saw the Japanese as an interesting thing, including sword. That's a religion. But they also couldn't resist giving out the Bibles and all. And the shogun didn't like that, threw them out. The Dutch came and they just wanted to trade. They didn't care about religion and they they didn't want to, they wanted to trade and the Japanese let them in and they stayed there for four hundred years, and they made money trading with them. Interesting. Yeah, the power it? of the economic 100%. networks, the communities. Absolutely. The, yeah, and being open to knowledge and not getting distorted by. Yeah. I'm not against religion at all, not in any way. Yeah. Not getting knowledge distorted by things that are not going to help. The people you're trading with at all. Yeah, understanding the the, the mission. You, you mentioned no Naka, so I got to yes. ask you the story about you tea. I love that story. It's a great. It's the importance <laughs> of tea related to knowledge, and this is something Laurel, you're gonna. You're yeah, gonna I love, love tea. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. So do I actually. <laughs> so needless to say, the Japanese do too. Uh, Professor Nonaka is, is sort of the equivalent of the Peter Drucker in the United States. He's a very, very well-known his management guru. Everyone knows him. He's, he's an older man now, but he's still alive, still working. He's on a committee that Ed and I are on, actually, uh, that, that Naoki's doing. So when he was a little bit younger, he got asked, and this is what happens to him, but 
by the head of the Canon company, the, the managing director. Could he come in and talk to us? He's in a not very polite, modest, small guy, comes in to speak to the managing director of Canon. And the managing director, you know, the Japanese, you never go right to the chase. You, know, you talk, how are you? How's the weather? Da, da, da. And finally, you know, things aren't going so well here. Think the morale seems to be slipping. Our sales aren't doing so well. Something's not right. Could you spend a, a week talking to people and come back and tell me what you found? He says, yes, yes. So he does that. His way, you know, goes, talks to people. They bow. They call him sensei, you know, master. He talks to people. And he comes back a week later. And the MD, the managing director, is all on his toes. You know, so I can't wait to hear what he's going to say. <laughs> They're sitting and finally, you know, and chatting. And finally, this guy is, you know, uh, Sensei, what have you learned in the last week? Do you have any ideas of what we could do? And the man, no, not because drink tea. Well, this would be like telling a fish to swim in Japan. I mean, <laughs> but what he meant when they elaborate a little is have all your senior people every day, instead of head down to go for your office, go to a room. And for half an hour an hour, have some tea and chat with one another. Very interesting. So he sat back and they have great respect for Nanaka. They have great respect for learning in Japan. It's an interesting country. And he said, we will do this. He called in the marketing operations, the human resources, all the senior vice presidents. Every morning, we would like you to come. There's a conference room there. There'll be very fine tea, green tea set up for you. We'd like you to come and speak for a minimum of half hour, whatever you want to talk about. It worked. They never spoke to each other otherwise. They put their head down, get up their papers. It worked. Drink tea. Oh my two gosh, words. What, you should write a book on that one. You could have Drink hired tea. me. That's amazing. <laughs> I know. I think he's used it. In, he, I heard him use it in a number of uh, presentations. He's written a few books. He's just. Yeah. Very modest fellow, but I thought that was a great story. I love it. I, he, I heard him sell it, and it's true. You know, he just said, and a lot of firms, large firms, no. the people never speak to each other at that level. They're, oh, well, you know that they're wrapped up in their work. They're busy. I can't yeah. talk to them. What does he want? You know, what does she want? And obviously, it would be great help to just say, "What are you up to? What are you doing? Oh, you're doing that. Have you ever tried this? Have you ever read this book and talked to people?" doesn't work for everyone, but it is a great story. And the, the power of stories, of communication, of con Ed and I talk, conversations. Yeah. That's action. knowledge. Man. That's, yeah, really, absolutely. that's what we're yeah, doing. Absolutely. Connection. We, um, we're starting to come to the end of our time. And I'd really love to find out a little bit more about what, having written so many books, um, I'd really love to hear a little bit more, Larry, about what you feel is your favorite part of the um, smart mission that, that is coming out in a few days. Well, they were all, you know, we wrote it together. We really did. There it is. There it is. <laughs> this book was really a collaborative effort. I mean, I, I, I've written other books where there was less so. This was tremendously collaborative, and I'm very happy for that. I, I think all the chapters are very valuable. Some of them will be more innovative to people than others, I think. But one of the things I think about the book that uh, made me think, you, you've talked a lot about economics. One of the things I've learned from you over the last five years is you read so many economic books and you've seen the change in economists now saying about the importance of intangibles, of which knowledge is yes. one of them. Yes. And I think that one of the things when we work this book together is the fact that intangibles have unique factors and that you you just don't have knowledge and learning you, you have to have effective teams you have to have a culture that supports it you, you have to promote it through the the stories that are told help something happen or it, it tills it off uh the importance of collaboration so i wonder if you can talk a little bit about intangibles in the modern economy because you you're the first person i heard really presenting that uh uh, in, in discussing the importance of intangibles. It's the same thing with individuals and with countries as it is with companies. Trust, a good wor working culture, open to learning. There's so many of them, and they're so important. I mean, you can have, make a great deal of money 
and just run by pure efficiency, bottom line. This is what happened to General Electric. There's a book out of it now. A guy ran it, Jack Wells. She became world famous. His picture was on the newspapers, things like that. All that counted was the bottom line. They're half dead. I mean, they had some great people there. They were, they were a great firm, half dead. They never thought about anything else. They broke up whole teams. Everyone, if you have 10 people, you could only get a fire or two of them. And those people may have been key to the team's functioning, but maybe they couldn't do things, couldn't be measured, so they got rid of them. I, I can't tell you how much I believe in this. And other people do too. It's not just us. We didn't invent this. But as this grows, as the economy, the global economy, certainly is becoming more based on ideas than anything else. I mean, look at Google, look at Amazon, look at all these global firms. It's ideas. It's not machinery. And as that seeps into the brains of people, they may start to value this more knowledge, ideas, learning, discussion, constantly thinking, what do we know? What don't we know? Uh, that's, I'm sorry I'm this old because I would have liked to have seen this stuff flourish in my youth, but we spent a lot of time on this and now it's really coming to true because the global economy. Is well, you were probably one of the igniters of making these kind of foundational changes in organizations. So. So I, I suspect that, that you can maybe uh, have a cup of tea with me and we can celebrate it sometime. <laughs> sure, Laurel, I'd be happy. To yeah, we're all getting Laurel. together in Boston, I heard. Yeah. Is that what the deal yes. is? Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yep, I'm ready. Yeah, anytime, Laurel. I'm, I'm happy. There was, we gave a conference once, in 1993, we had the first knowledge conference. And... Uh, I was at Ernst & Young. They thought we were crazy. They said, why don't you call it information? We can sell information. We can sell knowledge. <laughs> Leave me alone. Let me, I got a, one more question. Can I get one, one more question, question? And then we'll tie yeah. it out. And then, then you can send me home. You, more than anybody I know, you started several different uh, activities, uh, you know, that really were successful in terms of this whole area. The one I was most familiar with was the Babson program uh, that you did, yeah. and it was glorious. It really set the tone for a lot of organizations of how to learn about doing these things. What is it that has led you to be so successful of bringing something very diff difficult to, to these entities? What is it that, in your mind, made Babson, for example, successful? How did you, how did you frame that to, for success? That's an interesting yeah. question. I've never been asked that. And you'd understand the answer very well because it applies to you too. I was a born talker. My mother was the most talkative person I ever met, and I got that chromosome from her. Uh, in the fourth grade, I kept getting poor grades for conduct every year, first, second, third grade. My mother finally went in to speak to the principal, and she said, he's always getting bad grades for conduct. He's a nice boy. He's well-behaved. Well, he talks a lot. And my mother would say, he talks a lot. Maybe he'll be president. Are you crazy? What's wrong with talking a lot? I talk a lot. All my friends talk a lot. They shut the principal up. I like telling stories, which helps a lot. I do. It's a natural thing. It just, as it does for Ed, it just comes naturally to me to tell stories. And I had some relatives in show business who like performing. And I like performing. I like getting in front of people and talking about a subject, speaking with enthusiasm, telling some stories. Works for me. It works for a yeah. lot of people. So it's that social it must ingredient. Be true. It's I've that seen. elixir. Yeah, oh, so. man. Yeah. yeah, if I were training young executives or in charge of that, I'd say, learn how to speak, learn how to persuade. One of our, yeah. our co-authors, a great believer in how to, how to persuade people, how to influence people. And it works. It's important. I really yeah. believed in what I was talking about, too. I absolutely had great belief in how not these knowledge subjects we're talking about. And it was fun, flat out fun. We had wonderful people in that program, wonderful like Ed, quite a few others I could name. And it was global. And we had I a remember great time. learning from folks from Brazil and right. Canada and France and all. And yeah, you you, you could connect with people. Uh, it was a bringing together place and space for people who are interested in, uh, in learning and sharing, so. Yeah. It was a wonderful idea. We couldn't get, I couldn't get another organization. Babson just, I yeah. had to leave there. I didn't like it too much. And we couldn't get another organization to uh, fund it or uh, take an interest in it. But now everyone's in, everyone jumped on the boat. McKinsey does this. 
Price Waterhouse, MIT. They're all doing these global studies and inviting firms in to discuss what they're doing with intangibles. And so it's really kind of- So the key thing is to be boss. able to talk. So Laurel- Yeah. You can set this whole, the next generation of, uh, of knowledge, because if anyone's good at talking- I'm a talker, I'm a talker. Uh, but yeah. you know what's funny yeah. is I'm, uh, I'm a really yeah. great storyteller. I can convey my message really well, but the, um, the, the capability, the, the, uh, the magic wand of persuasion, I got to work on still, right? Like, cause I'm like, I told you all this great information, people let's move along and make the decision, right? Like, but that goes back to the drinking of the tea. If I, if I had the tea first with them, um, I wouldn't be in such a rush yeah. to move down the path of making the decision. Um, yeah. so I think there's a Good lot, point. there's a lot to be said Good about point. the the drinking of the tea to help with the persuasion, um, yeah. which builds the trust, which builds it's, the conversation. Uh, yeah. Another brilliant person, Edgar Schein, who's written so much about, um, culture. He, he talks about the notion of humble inquiry, which is, I think is the same kind of thing. He, he said, humbleness is we respect people. We show them respect. We account for them. We want to listen to them. And the inquiry is asking questions, not to get someone, but to have a really honest dialogue. And I think it's, uh, it, I think you hit on something really important. I think a lot of the success comes from making people feel welcome, invited in, that we're asking people to let's solve this thing. It's genuine as opposed to a, a game. And uh, so... Or some dull presentation, you know, consultants do. They throw up the slides and start pointing out. You know, one of the things that the Babson program did very well, we had nice yeah. accommodations. The school put out coffee and cookies and tea. And we'd meet like an hour before the actual content. And we'd all talk together. People, everyone became friendly yeah. with each other. It was a to very day. congenial group. Yeah, this, yeah. And all go up. To this day, all sorts of, we're still yeah. all in touch. A lot of us are. You're absolutely right. You would gain knowledge and weight because <laughs> the food was good and there would always be little snacks that's, around. That's why you need to walk the poodle, walk yeah. the poodle, like um, a lot right of after them. it, and then you'd be fine. Um, <laughs> speaking of, speaking of uh, you know, respect and, and value, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this session today, Larry. Um, you, you are a true um, oh, leader. Well in the industry of knowledge. And I just think in general of your thoughtfulness of the experiences that you've had and how you're able to connect with myself, with Ed, with, with so many others. And I think it's, um, I think it's a, a real special talent that you have. And I just want to thank you for, for sharing that with us. Yeah. Thank you, Laurel. It's been a pleasure. It really has. I didn't mind at all that we had to you know, repeat the uh, thing. Not at all. It's nice. Wonderful. Talking. Well, I can't wait to come out to Boston and join you, gentlemen. And thank you for anytime having your head in front of our the place where we grew yeah. up and uh, yeah. learned all about this. We like yeah, that. Gave us some energy. Yeah, yeah. I could see it. <laughs> Absolutely, I could see it. And thank, uh, thank you, and uh, Taleo. I think you're still giving out some copies of the Smart Mission when people comment and yes. have thoughts or questions. Absolutely. Right? So. I have comments and questions. Nice yeah. reminder, Ed. Anybody that has comments, questions, um, we are giving away the uh, the Smart Mission book to those people. We're also giving it away to um, our past guest speakers. And uh, it is going live on the 14th. I pre-ordered my book. Um, so I'm going to you know bring it with me so you guys can all sign it. Um, and I, I just can't wait to read it because I... I truly enjoy you guys, and I can I can only imagine the things I'm going to learn from that those little pages on the on the book. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. You're so part of the world. network. It's like, <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you guys. Um, thank you to our listeners, and have a have a great rest of your day. All righty. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Mission Driven Leader Podcast, presented by TaleoConnects.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review wherever you listen to the show. 